Uh, it's time for us for the next session. Uh, it's conducted by Sudhir Alakmal. It's He's the co-founder of uh, Eminify Me Healthcare Technologies. So Sudhir, without further ado, uh, it's time for you. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, thanks for the introduction. Let me let me share the screen. Like you know, uh, when uh, when you guys asked, uh, but uh, to present something on the session, I was uh, I thought of like you know uh, this. I choose this topic uh, because uh, this is uh, not a very common topic that uh, people discuss, and you can uh, get a lot of uh, ideas uh, on you know. Uh, uh, by looking at this uh, architecture and you know uh, to uh, other deploy other workloads as well so uh, so uh, in my uh, talk i'm going to basically discuss uh, in the first place why i choose this uh, topic uh, in the first place and uh, basic uh, things about uh, about a payment gate where the payment gateway lies in the payment process uh, so and what exactly uh, pcidss means <clears throat> and uh, i'll be uh, lightly touching on these areas and uh, and after that uh, why do we need uh, this type of architecture in the first place for for a payment gateway system which we are going to uh, host in cloud and some benefits and the features or the best practices that AWS DP uh, get by uh, going through this kind of architecture uh, um, and adapting this kind of architecture in our payment gateway application. And uh, lastly, I'll be discussing actually the actual implementation, uh, you know, uh, things that uh, hands on things that you will be uh, doing it while evaluating the PCIDSS. Uh, Standard. Right. Going to the next slide. The main reason I choose this topic is uh, to uh, tell you about the hands on uh, approach of I had uh, when deploying uh, a payment gateway system. So uh, I uh, first uh, did this in uh, 2014, 2014 and 13, which is, you know, uh, I was also uh, a bit new to AWS infrastructure and I was asked to uh, develop or uh, present an uh, architecture uh, to a payment gateway which will host on AWS. So I was totally uh, new uh, for this payment gateway uh, industry. So uh, then I uh, I thought of like, you know, and, and the, the components like VPC and RDSs are also like, you know, very new to me. And, what I thought was like, you know, uh, what should I do and how should I, you know, uh, tackle this? So my main uh, <clears throat> uh, main uh, concern and main uh, uh, um, what I did was like, you know, to adapt uh, whatever AWS best practices and deploy the uh, architecture and build the architecture on top of the best practices. So uh, I would say like, you know, based on that time, uh, I did it uh, for about 75-85% uh, uh, accurate, but when I see now, uh, I should have done uh, more improvements uh, on the architecture. So um, that is the main reason. I mean, uh, I'm choosing this topic like, to educate others and to if anyone is going to deploy a, a, a workload which is you know uh, running on bare metal and bringing it to the cloud, <laughs> this will be uh, an ideal topic. And uh, not only PCI, the the this best practice uh, frame, best practice uh, architecture can be used to any any other production workload deployments. Uh, this is one of the one of the cool uh, architecture I have uh, come across, and you can uh, you don't need to be uh, deploying a payment PCI compliance payment gateway. You can use it for any other workload, and that can be you can get a lot of uh, you know. Uh, improvements from security side and you know you know streamlining uh, the applications and you know the, the tools and all all things you can uh, streamline using uh, and looking at this uh, architecture and the other thing is like you know uh, uh, this is the aws best practice approach for pci uh, compliance so they have put a lot of weight they have put a lot of uh, time and uh, you know thought on you know creating this so if we are deploying a PCI standard uh, application, this is the, the, the ideal place to start. So that is the other thing. And uh, finally, I mean, uh, to, you know, uh, 
if someone is looking for for a you know bringing the application a payment application to the cloud this will be helpful to them also so uh, quickly i will start where we are going to discuss so this is basically the payment process uh, for the entire process basically a customer goes to online store and you know put his credit card and you know buy something and then uh, the fund is released to merchant and things like that so we are going to discuss uh, only this part the payment gateway a payment gateway hosted in the on aws cloud and <clears throat> when we are discussing it uh, this this payment process uh, process is also uh, sort of a uh, important because uh, the payment processor uh, will, I mean, uh, process the payment uh, in the payment gateway based on you know the payment processor will always check uh, whether this payment gateway is a, is a you know a whitelisted payment gateway. So uh, keep in keep in mind that uh, I mean uh, only certain uh, IP addresses or you know certain traffic will be uh, allowed to uh, go go to the payment processor. So, Moving to the next slide, uh, PCI DSS means it's like a no payment card industry data security standard. It is actually the best practices or the, uh, the uh, global payment. Uh, I mean, uh, the the mission of the PCI council is to you know enhance global payment uh, account data security and you know uh, develop standard uh, supporting and supporting services. And not only that, to educate and make awareness uh, of the users of, of, of this uh, payment gateways and you know implement uh, the, the the necessary standard quickly as possible and uh, bring up to the speed so that's the that's the uh, main uh, uh, you know uh, mission of uh, pci council so i'm not going to okay so why do we need this type of architecture so uh, if you think about the best practice architecture AWS has given, uh, we need this type of architecture to you know, enforce our uh, security baseline or to have a, a sound security uh, on our payment uh, gateway application. That is the number one. We call it CDN or basically we call it uh, card data network. So our card data network uh, should be you know very secure and uh, it should be you know not not uh, sort of a, in in a messy uh, environment it should be i mean from the ground up from the starting point it should be in a very clean and uh, very isolated uh, you know uh, infrastructure and uh, in the second point like you no know, uh, isolation is is one of the key point for example say you have a, a you know sort of a um, old application uh, it's not a wise you build your payment gateway application inside that vpc or uh, that uh, environment because uh, then your that other application is also comes to a uh, comes to the card data network so you you need to validate uh, the other application uh, security other applications connectivity on all sort of things uh, based on the PCI requirement. So uh, most of the time, what we do is we isolate the payment gateway, payment gateway application uh, in a separate VPC and build upon that. And uh, the isolation of the card data network is uh, one of the key uh, important thing. And the uh, other thing is like, you know, uh, you know when, you, when you have a, a environment, uh, payment gateway or, or some other system, uh, you need to you need other lot of uh, supporting uh, system uh, for example like you know you need monitoring you need you know vulnerability scanning and you know all sort of things like you know, log analysis all sort of things come comes into play so uh, it's not ideal to keep those other supporting services inside the payment gate as well so where do you put all these other uh, other services and other supporting services so uh, this architecture will allow us to, you know, uh, allow us to put uh, everything. I mean, every all other other things in different in different places and uh, make the payment gateway very secure. Right? Uh, so, is there any any question up to that point? Okay, 
next step. I'll move on. So these are like you know, I just uh, got some uh, benefits and features that uh, we will get out of this architecture. The first one is like you know, streamline, comment, and implement SQL baseline application, uh, payment gateway application, and uh, and at the initial design. That is uh, number one, and and this is provided by the provided by AWS, and they have put a lot of you know um, uh, thoughts. They have put a lot of uh, I mean uh, architectural designs, and you know a lot of people has put their uh, insights, and for example, like you know, security experts, and uh, like you know, people who know about compliance or PSA compliance and uh, AWS architects, all those people's ideas are encapsulated in this uh, architecture. So it is very important and vital that uh, we, we get those benefits uh, using this one. And uh, then like, you know, the, the best practices, like, you know, deploying it in uh, my days at like, you know, having uh, application servers and web servers in uh, different uh, availability zones, you know, to, you know, have it more uh, robust and you know, isolation of the instance, like you know, like you know, tier isolation, like you know, API tier, like you know, web servers, DB servers, and isolation of these instances, and you know, implement better security using security groups and network based uh, for you know uh, subnets and like that, and then uh, like you know, allowing us to you know use uh, IAM policies rather than you know using AWS uh, keys. Uh, to you know uh, accessing other services other AWS services uh, you know using role based uh, authentication like those things uh, I mean, I mean uh, with this architecture those things can be implemented and those features are uh, uh, built in so uh, that's the other uh, the benefits and features that we we'll get out of this architecture all right now, <clears throat> so this is this is exactly uh, the architecture uh, presented by AWS. What they are saying, okay, use this architecture if you are using a PCI compliance, uh, PCI DSS compliance, uh, payment gateway in, in the cloud. So um, let me, uh, before jumping into uh, any other things, I'll just uh, explain a little bit of the architecture. So normally we use uh, like, you know, a, a production VPC like this. We use it uh, in, in a standalone mode, like you now we use the production VPC, we either use a, a Bastion host to connect connect to that uh, VPC, or else like you know we connect our VPN, our office VPN uh, to that uh, VP, uh, production VPC and uh, directly log in from our office. And, and uh, this is uh, the uh, normal setup. But instead of what they have done is they have added a uh, management VPC and tier that VPC into the production. So this is very uh, very cool feature that uh, we can host only the payment gateway component inside this part, right? And we can offload whatever other components to the management VPC, such as uh, you know. Uh, Continuous integration tools, vulnerability scanning tool, monitoring tools, you know, log analyzing tools, and uh, all sort of other other components. We can uh, directly offload to the management VPC, and we can give you know very uh, controlled and limited access uh, to those people. So uh, this is why uh, this uh, uh, two VP peer VPCs are uh, a cool feature, and uh, I mean. Uh, that being said, um, I mean, the usability of these two uh, VPCs is totally uh, based on the user requirement and the user case. Uh, so, uh, for example, if you use these two uh, peer VPCs, you will get to pay for two net gateways. Right? You'll be, you, you, you need to deploy two net gateways over here and over here. But if you are, you know, if your budget is not that to uh, not up to that that level, so uh, I mean that's up to you to decide whether whether the security is uh, is the uh, key component or, or the price is the uh, thing. So uh, so now what I'm going to do is like you know uh, when when I got this uh, VPC setup uh, and when I want to implement in real world, uh, I had. Uh, some questions. I had some uh, issues. I, I, I 
need to do some improvements and things like that. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show like you know how I uh, I uh, set it up as for as per our requirement and you know did some improvements. Uh, some some are like you know some improvements and some things are like you know I have gone uh, um, gone and done for you know uh, for. Uh, uh, office requirements. Some are like you know based on uh, like you know auditors requirements. Some are based on uh, uh, for PCI you know compliance. So all these uh, captured uh, into a uh, different setup uh, than this. But ultimately, but uh, the the key uh, architecture remained like you know having two VPCs, uh, a management VPC and a production VPC and uh, PL. So. So that that architecture will remain as it is. So let's see uh, what are the um, improvements or things uh, we can do. So uh, first thing, uh, what we was like, no, we were not using uh, a hardware VPN connectivity uh, to any of our PCI uh, um, PCI. I mean uh, VPC uh, connect connectivity. So uh, I mean, so I had to design a, a software VPN. So what I did was like you know I uh, I installed my uh, OpenVPN inside the public uh, subnet. So I'll be connecting uh, from this client directly using a VPN uh, connect connection. So in order to even get inside uh, to the management VPC, I need to have a VPN connection. Otherwise, this won't allow you to connect. So my initial uh, connectivity will be uh, coming through. Uh, through a VPN pipeline. So what I did was like you know I moved the bastion hub inside the private subnet because uh, the previous uh, AWS setup it was uh, set up in the public subnet instead of I moved it inside and uh, that is one uh, that is uh, the second thing uh, moving the bastion hub inside. Say if you are connecting from this host, uh, let me. Uh, Show you like the first I I initiate a VPN connecting to OpenVPN and once the VPN connection is established, I basically my network is uh, extended to my uh, management VPC. I directly SSH from this to this uh, STN host private IP address. Then um, there's a you know SSH key validation over here for my user account. For example, I SSH as Lakmal and uh, Lakmal. The public keys uh, inside the Bastion host. I'll be able to connect to the. Uh, I'll be able to connect to the Bastion host. The second thing in, in PCI uh, compliance the documentation. Uh, there's a requirement like if you are connecting from you know uh, remote uh, to any of the uh, any of the uh, payment gateway components or payment gateway servers. Uh, it need to be have you need to be have uh, two factor authentication. So uh, that was the second uh, problem I was having. So uh, what I did was like you know uh, having two factor authentication. You know all these places, all these uh, Linux servers that I'll be deploying will be a nightmare for for me and for those who will be connecting. So I, what I did was like you know uh, I I installed uh, two factor uh, um, Google two factor authentication. To the best in, so it will ask me uh, to validate my uh, uh, key authentication first, and then it will ask me the two-factor uh, six six uh, uh, digit two-factor password uh, for the uh, to enable. I mean to go inside the best in. Then from this onwards, I can access uh, to any of these servers so that is also uh, there is uh, two ways of doing it uh, one is like you know you can have a common user created over here and you know uh, put the public key over here and directly ssh using this this for uh, but uh, that being said that is not uh, not ideal because uh, i mean if a lot of people are connecting uh, to the best in house and a lot of people are connecting to the private subnets you never know like, which person uh, log into the server. So all these logs will be analyzed and you know all these logins will be uh, validated and you know those things uh, will be uh, uh, reviewed. 
so uh, it's best to have you know uh, SS, ssh keys connecting because there are there will be not lot, i mean there will be uh, limited users that connecting through the either web servers or the api server so you can uh, create ss generic i mean uh, general uh, users over here and connect uh, using ssh keys uh, over here so then you will get to know like you know what person connect what server at what time using the, using the login so uh, using a generic user uh, i don't recommend uh, that part but uh, that being said, this is actually my requirement. So it is up to you uh, how you you know uh, manage it. Even if you are okay to you know enable uh, or install two-factor authentication, uh, Google two-factor authentication uh, for all these servers, that is the ideal way of doing. It. Uh, but uh, having said that, you have to be uh, practical on in, in, uh, real life. And the other thing is like you know uh, there are some. Uh, situation where you know uh, the db connection users uh, need to be isolated in a different uh, bastion house that is also like you know uh, case by case uh, some uh, organizations will uh, ask for that some will use the same bastion house to both uh, you know uh, devs and dbs to uh, use the same uh, bastion house that is also uh, user case by case so uh, if you have any uh, question uh, on this slide uh, I, I can uh, answer okay i'll move into the next slide improvement two so uh, other important factor is the centralized login so uh, it's not uh, not only centralized login all these logs need to be uh, real time analyzed and you know uh, you know uh, uh, get uh, notifications upon you know uh, based on uh, access and all those uh, based on your requirement for example if you have you know um, uh, not uh, valid uh, logins and all those things you need you need to capture and you know uh, alert and authenticate that is why it is happening so this is uh, one of the uh, methods i uh, found uh, uh, which will go align with uh, my requirement uh, that's why i put basically what uh, what our requirement was to you know have all the logs, uh, not only you know CloudTrail logs, uh, AWS logs, all the uh, audit logs, uh, then uh, Sys logs, and uh, all all other sort of logs need to be you know uh, pushed to a different AWS account uh, and store there and analyze and uh, run run those analysis uh, in a in a different account uh, where we don't have that uh, account access. So, uh, um, I mean, uh, the designers of the payment gateway won't have the login account access. They will they will analyze in a different account where we can't log in or we can't uh, go and delete those uh, accounts. So, uh, this is sort of a some sort of a requirement. So, uh, that can be done basically. You can uh, pipe all the logs to a, a, a cloud uh, watch log group and analyze there uh, using uh, either Lambda. Or any any sort of you know um, and you know put it to elastic cache and you know use gray log or any sort of tool uh, to that that will make you know your requirement and uh, have it there and uh, uh, put uh, alerts and upon analyzing that is uh, how how the logging uh, part uh, work and. The other important thing is is, is OS hardening. So by default, when you uh, deploy your uh, Amazon uh, machine image, say uh, you deploy Ubuntu 20.04 LTS, so it, it it's it's it comes with uh, you know uh, some sort of a hardening. Uh, about 65 percent, 75 percent, that image itself is uh, is a hardened image. But uh, you know when you are uh, into you know uh, when you are into when you're building a, a payment gateway that will, you know, uh, uh, do transaction of millions of dollars, uh, you can't uh, take that uh, 65% uh, Amazon machine image. You have to harden. So, uh, in order to harden, uh, the best place to start is uh, CIS benchmark. So, you, there are, you know, benchmark uh, for each and every OSS. If you are using Ubuntu, you have a separate document. You go uh, to that, and you will. Uh, there'll be about 200, 300 controllers that you need to check manually, 
and uh, harden the OS based on that. So uh, when you say hardening, uh, there are mandatory requirements, mandatory hard hardening uh, components, and there are uh, optional components as well. So mandatory are in in Ubuntu in the latest uh, uh, CIS benchmark they have mentioned as uh, uh, level two uh, requirements. Level two are other mandatory requirements that uh, anyway you need to do those things. So that's. Uh, Hardening is, is uh, number one. So uh, after the CIS benchmark uh, hardening, the the machine image will uh, come to uh, a level where you know it's hardened for eighty five percent and or ninety five around ninety. So that's a very uh, very uh, valid uh, figure for for a, to deploy your payment gateway application. That. Being said, I mean, uh, you don't necessarily need to have Ubuntu, but there are other other OSs as well. CIS benchmark is also available for uh, Amazon uh, version two and uh, all other uh, OSs. You can go and uh, check and harden. And the after the hardening, the next step is you integrate. Uh, you are in, you need to install a file integrity monitoring software. So uh, in my case, I used uh, OSEC. Uh, there, there are like you know paid version and uh, you know enterprise editions and all, all sort of things uh, that is actually is uh, defined by uh, I mean requirement is for your your requirement that that will depend on your on your requirement basically so what I did was like you know I uh, I uh, installed this uh, OSIC as a, a server client uh, application where my client is installed on the payment gateway uh, component inside. And I, my server was I, I was uh, I moved my server outside the uh, payment gateway and kept in kept it in the uh, uh, management VPC. So uh, in installing and configuring file integrity monitoring software, uh, you need to be uh, more, uh, I mean very careful. Like uh, you need to tell uh, it what to monitor. For example, you don't you have to you know uh, remove like you know. Uh, Places like war logs and things like that. What I, I mean, uh, log creation directories and uh, temp directories and things like that. You need to exactly tell the file integrity monitoring software what to monitor. Like you know, uh, your uh, your password file, your etc directory, your you know configuration directories of your you know payment gateways right? and important places that you need to monitor. If there's any 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 file file change or integrity change, uh, access change, all these things. To uh, alert those things, right? That is, uh, and OSIC and require uh, um, like, you know, two uh, uh, softwares that you can use. And the other thing is, like you know, uh, the other important factor is time synchronization. Whether you are using GMT or UTC or you know standard um, um, uh, IST, you need to you need to synchronize your. I mean, you, you need to synchronize. Uh, your time based on you know time synchronization uh, system or oh, it should be all the servers uh, host servers um, containers and dbs everything should be on a, on a proper time with the proper time synchronization so what i've seen is like you know uh, uh, sometime back i was using atp as a as a good solution uh, for time synchronization but you know uh, with the um, uh, latest uh, uh, implementation. What I what I thought was like you know, when you use ATP, you need to open you know ports on uh, VPCs, uh, network ACLs, uh, security groups. Uh, you need to open both TCP and UDP ports in uh, both places. So uh, I was not comfortable with, uh, using it. Then I was when I was uh, you know uh, trying to figure out how we can do it. Do it I found uh, Prony. Prony is a different. Uh, different implementation of uh, NTP. You don't need to open any any port or any um, protocol uh, in any of the um, from the basic uh, base VPC. What you need to do is only allocate I mean, install Tron on on your required servers or containers, and then uh, uh, put the uh, Tron configuration uh, pointing to uh, AWS uh, one nine uh, AWS. Uh, uh, Prony uh, IP address that will uh, solve your time synchronization problem uh, pretty easy. So, uh, is there any any question up to this slide? 
Right. Uh, moving on to the improvement three or the things uh, I did uh, after that. So uh, then um, there are requirement of of a super vulnerability scanning tools. So uh, uh, I was using uh, policies. So what I did was like you no know, um, policies is uh, so basically in when when you are doing PCI, you need to uh, partly submit your uh, scanning results of your uh, uh, host uh, servers and everything. And you need to submit and uh, validate your, uh, every quarter you need to validate uh, those uh, scans. And uh, you can't have, uh, you know, uh, critical errors uh, or, you know, um, warnings uh, at higher than two. So uh, zero is the uh, one is the uh, one is the uh, most uh, less and uh, six is the highest. So uh, you can't have uh, category two uh, issues uh, on your payment gateway. So you need to scan every quarter. So uh, my tool I was using is uh, is a cloud based one. But I did I mean but it does it's like you know it gives you a cloud uh, console and you need to deploy your uh, scan, scanning tool or policies tool uh, inside this public subnet so it connects using cloud over here and i, I can scan uh, from this uh, from this network all these servers all these subnets i can scan so scanning will be done in uh, two ways like you know there are internal scans and also there are external scans so internal scans basically you point uh, the internal of, of IP of this one of these machines, and you directly scan the machine and see what are the vulnerabilities and patch them uh, one by one. And uh, external scan is basically you can scan uh, endpoint like you know uh, ALB or an, an endpoint uh, or public IP address that you you have using that uh, policy scan. Um, that is about uh, vulnerability scanning, and the other one is uh, code deployment. So actually, Richard said about uh, the code deployment and uh, cloud on, on the cloud. So um, if your code deployment is on the cloud, uh, that is up to you how 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 you you know manage it and you know how how you hook the uh, deployment tool inside uh, this management PPC. So most probably it will be uh, hooked into the public subnet. But if you're, you know, if you're using, you know, uh, old Jenkins uh, kind of, a, you know, uh, your own hosted version, you can always uh, move it to the private subnet and uh, use uh, as it is. And uh, monitoring and monitoring tools, there'll be a lot of monitoring tools. You, you'll be, you know, um, relying on the different not not only not on single monitoring tool, you'll be relying on different monitoring such as Prometheus, and you know, if you are using um, ECS on in any of these places, you'll be using Prometheus Grafana or or even AWS CloudWatch and all sort of monitoring tools, and maybe you know externally from Nigeria and things like that. So uh, those things, whatever uh, you need to be hosting, you'll be uh, hosting inside this private subnet, or if you need uh, external access, you need uh, over here. But uh, my suggestion is you install, you go and install in, in a private subnet. And the other key component is why this architecture is more important uh, than anything is uh, when you come to uh, a place where when you are installing a penetration testing tool. So if you don't have uh, an asset uh, in your team that that who is responsible doing you know, penetration testing and all sort of security security testing? You need to uh, you need to bring a third party uh, to do uh, penetration testing on behalf of uh, you. So uh, you know, bringing a third party uh, penetration testing uh, person uh, into you know this architecture. Uh, if we have only this uh, this production VPC, it will be a, a nightmare. Because uh, you you will be giving direct access uh, to all these things. I mean, you have a direct access. I mean, you can even turn it or one of these servers and DBs. So, 
But uh, when you have a very management VPC, what you can do is when you can have the third party company or the third party uh, person to lobby with the open uh, VPN or you know any, any sort of VPN hardware you can connect connectivity to the management VPC and uh, host uh, the penetration testing tools inside <coughs> inside the private subject. So that, that is actually the, one of the plus point uh, that you will definitely uh, uh, encounter if you are using uh, this sort of uh, architecture. So uh, moving on to the next uh, slide, uh, so improvement uh, four. Uh, now actually we will discuss about uh, deploying, the, deploying your actual payment gateway inside the PCI VPC. So uh, if your VPC this is actually a case by case. Uh, this, uh, I mean, uh, up to this will totally depend on on how your application is designed. So, if you have a, a front end web application uh, in the payment gateway, um, I suggest you deploy the front end web servers inside the uh, private subnet and uh, expose using the front end uh, ALB. Uh, the main reason. Uh, what, why I am suggesting is like you no. Know, uh, some some people can say like you no. Know, you go and deploy the front end web server in the public subnet, but uh, I don't think that is uh, that is a requirement. And the other hand, like you know, if you are using uh, uh, things like ECS, where you know you will auto scale and you know you can't have a, you know single uh, public IP address. It's best to uh, host it in a private subnet and use your net gateway to connect to the third parties that is the ideal way like you know then you can uh, you can uh, give your or register your third party uh, with your third party or net gateway uh, elastic ip address so you won't be able to, then you'll be uh, able to connect using your net gateway directly uh, to their uh, infrastructure so uh, so that is uh, how you deploy your uh, front-end web, web, web application and always try to use uh, AWS uh, best practices uh, upon deployment like you know uh, use auto scaling uh, as much as possible and use ECS if your application is compatible with uh, if you are deploying in containers use ECS or you know other other sort of uh, sort of uh, container application and Use always uh, high availability in deployments. You know, like you know, uh, one availability just won't uh, have an issue. Like you know, your payment application will still be running with the, the other. And <clears throat> I mean, uh, if for auto scaling, check how you want to implement it. Like either time based or network based or CPU based auto scaling, and uh, based on your requirement, implement those things. Right. Okay, moving on to uh, the moving to improvements five, or like you know how you uh, how you manage your uh, APIs. So if your uh, application is uh, application has uh, these sort of tiers, like if you are deploying your APIs, try to deploy uh, in a in a separate subnet uh, other than the web applications uh, subnet. Use an internal uh, ALB. If if you are not, if your API is not directly ex exposing outside, you use a uh, uh, use a internal ALB and you know wire it to the front end application. Um, then it will be easy uh, for you to uh, implement like a load balance, uh, like you know all, all the uh, best practice uh, features uh, that AWS will provide uh, into your application. Right. And then the other other uh, thing is like you no, know, you your uh, payment processor. Whoever your payment processor is, definitely will uh, need to whitelist your IP uh, IP addresses of your uh, APIs. So uh, by deploying it inside, uh, you will have the benefit of uh, whitelisting uh, your uh, net gateway IP address uh, only your net gateway IP address. So you'll be able to you know uh, connect to your payment processor for uh, payment processing, right? Uh, so, am I too fast? Uh, do we have any question on this? No questions so far. Right. Okay. 
So uh, we want to uh, the, the last stage, uh, how, how we are going to uh, deploy the DB. So uh, this is actually uh, the DB deployment should be done in, in a separate subnet. Uh, it should be not in, uh, not in your API subnet, it should be a separate subnet. So uh, I have both experience in, uh, you know, uh, DBs on EC2 and RDS. But my personal opinion is uh, is always uh, go with RDS. That is uh, for uh, I mean quite few reasons. Um, I mean when you when you uh, but that being said, like you know that need to be decided by uh, you uh, because like you know uh, RDS is uh, not uh, cheap, and if your budget is you know with uh, EC2, uh, you can. Uh, have uh, easy to, but uh, having said that, it will come uh, with uh, with the price, right? Uh, you will have to pay more attention on uh, EC2. You will have to do more, you know, uh, maintenance uh, on EC2, and you have to, you know, manually set up uh, all the, you know, replication and all sort of things uh, manually, and all sort of things are things will be there. But you know, if you are using RDS, uh, uh, try to. Uh, if, you, if it is a production one, try to make sure you use multi AZ. So that is uh, number one. So you need to use uh, multi AZ uh, deployment because uh, if you fail your master uh, server, uh, uh, the delay will be about uh, 60 to 120 seconds. That will be, the other one will be uh, kicked in, and uh, other one, I mean, the other side of the uh, DB will be uh, activated. So uh, it, it will be easy on your application and it will be easy for you all as well. And, uh, and the other thing is, uh, depending on the, the software using uh, in the RDS, for example, if you are using MySQL, uh, you, you'll be using master slave. <coughs> but if you are using like, you know, uh, uh, Aurora, there's a possibility that you can use uh, both, uh, both servers at the same time like you know you can use uh, multi master as multi master but uh, if you're using uh, you know standard uh, mysql you'll be like using uh, one master at a time right <coughs> and the other cool feature comes with rds is uh, the performance insights like you know, uh, in production enable performance insight all these things uh, matters uh, for, for smooth smooth running your application so uh, you, you you'll get to know a lot of uh, things uh, using enabling performance insight. I know you, you'll have you will see like you know slow queries and all those things uh, will be available. Like and you know uh, all sort of uh, metrics you can get uh, using enabling uh, performance insight. So if you are using RDS, always uh, have performance insight enabled. And try to deploy the RDS internally. You don't need to deploy it, uh, you know, uh, accessing externally. So these are actually not, not, uh, I mean, uh, uh, concentrated on, you know, PCI and payment gateway, but you know, always in, in, if you are deploying uh, RDS, try to deploy uh, it uh, internally. So you, you have a lot of benefits and, and you know, have to have a DNS, uh, uh, on your RDS endpoint, you know, these are these will be very small things, but uh, at the end of the day, it will make a, a lot different uh, in, in, in a real world application. And the other important thing is open the uh, RDS to uh, only to the subnet that your uh, servers are connected to, uh, to the DB. So if the if the API is if, if only the APIs are connecting, only open the RDS to or open the subnet, uh, private subnet, DB subnet uh, uh, to the APIs. If, if the web, front end web servers are connecting, uh, open to the front end web servers. Or so, that being said, like you know, that will depend on, on your application design and uh, case by case. And uh, some other uh, features that you will uh, have to look into is like you know, uh, time zone. I spoke uh, this previously. How uh, the uh, I mean your uh, workload time zone uh, one specific time zone if it is GMT or UTC uh, likewise uh, your requirement 
based on your requirement have the time zone set on the db as well and uh, you can have uh, minor version uh, automatic minor version update uh, in the rds itself so uh, i said that some some will uh, not like that feature but some will like so uh, try to you know use those uh, all those uh, features like you know readily available uh, comes in rds and uh, the other thing is like you know uh, you need to have some sort of an idea like you know how many iops you, you need to have on your production db uh, that's a must uh, you need to if it is uh, i mean uh, your iops is basically uh, uh, define the the space of your i mean the size of your uh, how large your database is and and the other important factor is like you know uh, don't start your db with a, you know 200 300 gb uh, size if it is not necessary if your db is like you know 5 6 gb the minimum you can go is up to uh, minimum you can uh, start is 20 start from 20 gb don't start it uh, you know with uh, with uh, you know high uh, storage uh, facility because like you know you anyway you you need to increase uh, as time goes by and also like you know there there is uh, auto uh, increasing facility uh, in recent time with rds you can uh, enable like you know how much of storage that you can auto increase uh, by default so use those features if you need and uh, other important thing is like you know uh, or <coughs> try to uh, enable backup uh, for production DBs, always have uh, automated backup and uh, mindful about the time of the backup. Don't enable your backup uh, during the high peak hours, enable it in off peak hours. And uh, also, like you know, uh, uh, the retention period of your backup. Uh, have a discussion uh, how, how many uh, days, how many, uh, how many months that you are going to retain your backups. So, have an idea on, on those things. and. Uh, enable those things in uh, AWS uh, itself. And the other important thing is uh, uh, try to have uh, separate option groups and parameter groups. Uh, the reason why, I'm, uh, why I am telling is like, you know, uh, when you spawn an RDS, it will, it will, uh, if you don't specifically go and say uh, uh, option groups separately or create option groups separately or, you know, parameter groups separately, uh, it will uh, load with the default one. But uh, default one, uh, you'll be able to, I mean, if you are using default one uh, across uh, different uh, uh, different DBs, uh, it will be a problematic uh, to update, you know, configuration parameters uh, based on your uh, payment gateway with DB. So have a separate, have separate uh, option groups, parameter groups and uh, things like that. And be mindful of the storage because uh, uh, even though you can scale down the class of the RDS, you won't be able to uh, scale down the uh, or shrink the uh, size of the volume of the DB. So uh, be mindful. Though. And uh, the other important factor is uh, encryption. So for a payment gateway uh, RDS, en encryption is is a uh, key. It is number one. And uh, when when you in uh, and I'll give you another tip. Uh, when you uh, implement uh, encryption, uh, use your own KMS key. Uh, because um, there was a problem uh, when I, uh, I I was uh, trying this. If you have a have the default encryption key, if you need to you know uh, uh, clone this uh, RBS into a different account, you won't be able to do it. Uh, so default and if you uh, start with the default encryption key you won't be able to uh, do uh, you know cloning this uh, uh, database and create it in, in a separate VPC um, because uh, creating uh, uh, in a separate VPC you will uh, get to you will get that uh, you use you use a requirement uh, like you know uh, for you know having a DR say you are running your uh, payment gateway application on uh, california but uh, your dr will be in virginia kind of situation so uh, that that will be a uh, definitely a requirement so uh, mindful about you know uh, enabling in encryption on rds and uh, read about you know how to uh, you know have uh, different key ms keys and things like that and the other thing is uh, enable delete protection it, uh, and uh, set the maintenance window based on your uh, off-peak and peak hours 
for your record. And this will be my last slide. <coughs> so uh, this is uh, the the one I uh, talked about previous, like you know uh, having a DR site. So uh, based on your requirement, you will have the entire setup uh, created in a different uh, region um, with the web servers and load balancers and things like that. Everything, and you will be having a, a read replica or you know. A replica of the uh, payment gateway VPC in a different re region. So uh, that will be uh, 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 actually case by case and user based on user requirement. Normally, uh, what uh, audit uh, people will ask is like, you know, this uh, the secondary uh, DR site, uh, the primary uh, people will not uh, have access to the secondary DR site. It will be a separate uh, account, it will be a separate. Uh, I mean, uh, the owners of the or the users of the that account will be a separate uh, team. So uh, that's uh, about uh, creating the DRM. So uh, I mean, uh, the things I talked about uh, in, in related to DB is not uh, not everything um, based on a payment gateway. Those are like you know even uh, for general uh, workloads, uh, those things will be applied. So those things can be used uh, in. Any any of the workloads that you will be uh, deploying in uh, AWS. Uh, so uh, I think uh, that concludes uh, my uh, presentation. Um, I have put uh, some references uh, that you can uh, go through um, that I used and uh, that you can also go through. So I think uh, the slides will be shared and uh, you can check those things and have a thought and. Uh, I think I have my email address also. If you have a, a question or if you have a query on any specific thing, you can directly write to me also. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sudhir. Uh, it's time for questions. So guys, if you have questions, please direct them at uh, Sudhir. Uh, while others get ready with their questions, uh, so there, this is not directly into AWS. Uh, so, yeah. how long does it take uh, to like uh, after your implementation of the entire architecture to get the entire like uh, PCI compliance? Uh, so uh, we had only one, one month uh, to uh, architect it and uh, uh, do the initial uh, compliance. It will uh, take about uh, two to three months uh, as for my uh, experience because uh, you know uh, there'll be you know uh, documents and this is actually the part of the infrastructure only there'll be uh, you know documentation part uh, separately about 300 400 documentation like you know how the users will be created how the users will be granted and we are the uh, see how the ci is done and all those things will be uh, separate procedures and guidelines we have to uh, create it and submit to uh, their review so uh, based on uh, that that those documentation review and based on your network diagrams and reviews, uh, you'll be get uh, uh, you know uh, approved the uh, granted PCI. Hi, thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, then let's wind up the session. Uh, so thank you very much, Sudhir, for joining us today. It was a very wonderful session uh, because uh, PCI is very interesting topic uh, when it comes to payments, and uh, a lot of Sri Lankan startups are moving into uh, fintech, and I hope uh, many would uh, find it very interesting. So once again, thank you very much, Sudhir, and uh, thank you very much, you. Richard, uh, for joining us today. And uh, for the rest of you, I hope uh, all of you will join uh, the community day. So let's see you guys on the next month. Enjoy, guys. Awesome. Thanks for having me.